if you notice how the video starts off, I'm posing questions. And those questions are answered through the rest of the film. I bring this up to have you guys think about the questions you're posing in your journals, right? And the and, and the ways to pose these questions and the three the three forms of questions that I always articulate. Question for knowledge production, right? I don't understand this, so I have a question. Question that produces research, which you've seen exhibited in the video, right? And then question for critique. So I just want, again, to bring this up to get you guys to start thinking about questions from the last two standpoints, questions for critique and questions that produce further research. And I think the video exhibits a, a great example of how to pose these questions to help guide your projects, your writing, whatever the case may be. So let's jump into the text. I won't spend too much time on James Baldwin himself because we, we did that last week. So I'm going to just jump into the actual text itself. Um, as we know, this is from a collection of essays from the book entitled The Fire Next Time. Uh, we read the letter to my nephew, uh, my dungeon shook. And, and for me, I was really struck by the way that the, the letter starts off, right? Um, I begun this letter five times and I tore it up five times. So one could assume or one can glean that this is, we're reading the sixth version of his attempt to communicate with his nephew. Um, also, this speaks to his desire for perfection in the way that he wants to art express himself. And then also vulnerability, right? Um, arguably one of the greatest writers in American for, period, right? And he's telling you that I even had to start over five times. Right. So it's, to me, this is this element of vulnerability becomes very important. And then he, he shifts into this triangulization of his nephew, his brother, which is his um, nephew's father and his father or the nephew's grandfather. And he talks about the similarities in their look, um, the similarities in their demeanor. And then he shifts a little bit more to focus on the grandfather or Baldwin's father. And if you're familiar with the work of Baldwin, you would know, you know that his father is very pervasive in all of his writing, especially if you think about the book um, Gotan on the Mountain, which serves as somewhat of Baldwin's autobiography. You see the pervasiveness of Baldwin's father and you see how Baldwin's father just really worked on eroding James Baldwin's self-esteem. But then he gives you a little bit more insight about the, his father his nephew's grandfather. You may be like your grandfather in this. I don't know. But certainly both of you, both you and your father resemble him very much physically. Well, he is dead. He never saw you and he had a terrible life. He was defeated long before he died because at the bottom of his heart, he really believed that, excuse me, he really believed what white people said about him, okay? So he's showing how this impacted his grandfather. Then he'll continue on. You can only be destroyed by believing that you really are what the white world calls a nigger. So this is his warning to his nephew based on what he's seen his own father go through, right? His father's life was terrible because he really believed what white folks said about him. He believed that to be true. So warning, the only way that you can be destroyed is by believing what they say about you, right? Cautionary. Um, and he also mentions, right, not only did I see this happen to my father, I watched your father, my brother, battle this as well, right? It says that um, I know what the world has done to my brother and how narrowly he has survived it. And I know, which is much worse, and this is the crime of which I accuse my country and my countrymen, and for which neither I, nor time, nor history will ever forgive them. That they have destroyed and are destroying hundreds of thousands of lives, and do not know it, and do not want to know it. One can be, sorry, one can be, indeed, one must strive to become tough enough Excuse me, let me just forget all that. So he's saying, right, that they're destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and then they act like they don't know or they don't want to know. And then he continues with, 
but it is not permissible that the authors of devastation should also be innocent. It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. What is Baldwin saying with that? What is he trying to get at? It is the innocence which constitutes the crime. What do you think that means? So let's unpack. We know, right? He says that they're destroying hundreds of thousands of lives and they don't know it or don't want to know it. Okay. This is the claim that he makes earlier in the paragraph. Then towards the bottom of the page, he states it is not, but it is not permissible. What does permissible mean? What is the definition of permissible? Well, a working definition that we could use of permissible. Like they're not a they're not they don't need to know it. Looking at the chat, I think um Ash Lynn is, is spot on to allow, right? It's not allowed, it's not okay. So it's not permissible, it's not allowed that the authors of devastation. So who are the authors of devastation? Who is he referring to? So he says that they're destroying hundreds of thousands of lives. Who are they? Who are the authors of devastation? What do you think? Who do we think the authors of devastation are? Who is Baldwin referring to with this? Who was trying to maintain their innocence? Juan, who do you think the authors of devastation are? Okay. Vanessa says the people of, of privilege. I agree. What's another way to say that, Vanessa? More um, bluntly. Who are these people of privilege, Vanessa? Because you're right, but just say what it is. It's okay. What? Yep. Thank you, Marjorie. Can you say that out loud, please? Y'all don't, don't want to say white people? You want me to say it out loud? Yeah, say it out loud. It's okay. Oh, white people, yeah. yeah. That's who the, the authors of devastation are, okay? So, it is not permissible that the authors of devastation is not allowable, it's not allowed that white people, right, should also be innocent. Innocent, excuse me. It's the innocence which constitutes the crime. What does that last part mean? It's the innocence which constitutes the crime. That's the, my real question. What does that last part mean? What do you think that last part means? Think about the pillars of white inferiority. That will give you the clearest conception of what Baldwin is thinking about here. So what are the pillars of white inferiority? Please somebody state that out loud for me. There's two. Do you guys not know what Baldwin's pillars of white inferiority are? You talked about that last week. Thank <laughs> you. 
Destiny, what are the, can you name for me, please, one Baldwinian pillar of white inferiority? Um, I can, can I guess on yeah. one of them? That's for sure, absolutely. Um, can it be disrespecting the mm -hmm. white premises? No, that's not one of them. Um, Ashlyn, could you help her out? Uh, I'm actually not sure either. Okay. Miguel, can you help out either Destiny or Ashley? I also don't know. Okay. Um, Arturo says critical race theory. Um, Marjorie, do you think Arturo is correct? Uh, it can be, but I'm not sure. So what Arturo is thinking about are our theoretical frameworks, one of which being critical race theory, um, the framework being counter storytelling, but that's not a pillar of white inferiority. Um, so the two pillars of white inferiority, according to James Baldwin, is the maintenance of white innocence and the white imagination. Um, next week is your midterm. We spent all of last week's class discussing the pillars of white inferiority. So I would suggest all of you on this um, Zoom, watch last week's lecture because this will be in your midterm. You will have to know what these pillars of white inferiority are. So I, I would definitely suggest that you go back and, and re-engage. Last week's lecture is on your Google Classroom site. Um, but it's the innocence which constitutes the crime. What Baldwin is getting at with that? Right. I don't know if y'all have, have been in conversations with white folks talking about race. Oftentimes what comes up is I wasn't alive during that time. You cannot fault me for what my ancestors did, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Baldwin is saying, look, I'm not concerned with what your ancestors did. I get what happened in the past as part of the past. I get that. But where the problem is, is you trying to act innocent as if all these things that happened in the past did not happen, right? It's the innocence which constitutes the crime. So it's not the devastation that you've been causing, but it's the fact that you know you're causing devastation, but you pretend like you're still innocent. You pretend like you did not do that, right? This is the crime that he's charging them with. Does that make sense? So that's where the white, the maintenance of white, um, the maintenance of white innocence comes into play, that pillar of inferiority. Um, let me just give you one second, we're getting in the chat. Um, Ashton is not necessarily, it's a pretend innocence. Cause so what Ashton put in the chat was, so is it their innocence that enables racism, right? Um, ignorance, excuse me. So is it their ignorance that enables racism? It's not an ignorance. It's not a pure ignorance, right? I'm going to pretend to be ignorant so that way I cannot be accountable for my actions. Does that make sense, Ashley? Do you get the distinction between like the ignorance and a, a perceived or a pretend innocence? I'm sorry. A pretend innocence. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense, actually. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, bet. So... And then, so there's a shift that kind of takes place, right? And, and for me, this shift takes place once he starts to talk about his nephew being born, right? This is where like love starts to make its appearance in, in a real strong fashion. To be loved, baby, hard, at once and forever, to strengthen you against the loveless world. Remember that, I know how black it looks today for you. It looked bad that day too. Yes, we were trembling. We have not stopped trembling yet, but if we had not loved each other, none of us would have survived. And now you must survive because we love you and for the sake of your children and your children's children, right? So love, and I think Vanessa hit this on the head earlier, um, love does the work that allows for these people to survive, right? Love is the force that will counter the loveless world. 
and is needed so that way your children's children can, can survive this world, okay? He continues, this innocent country set you down in a ghetto in which, in fact, it intended that you should perish. Let me spell out precisely what I mean by that. For the heart of the matter is here and the root of my dispute with my country. You were born where you were born and face the future that you face because you were black and for no other reason. The limits of your ambition were thus expected to be set forever. You were, I'm sorry, you were born into a society which spelled out with brutal clarity and in as many ways as possible that you are a worthless human being. You were not expected to aspire to excellence. You were expected to make peace with mediocrity. Wherever you have turned game. So this idea that your color will ascribe where you live, right? Because the color of your skin, you are forced, demarcated and closed into the Nickerson Garden Projects. You're forced into the Jordan Downs Projects. You're forced into the jungles. You're forced to live off of Breed and Soto, right? And because you're there, your reality can't go beyond there, right? You don't know what's beyond the 10 freeway. You don't know what's beyond the 605 and the um, 110, right? You're trapped in this space. And your life potential is trapped within this space. And he says they did this and sat you there so that you could get comfortable with it, right? He says that the the details and symbols of your life have been deliberately constructed to make you believe what white people say about you, right? So all these stereotypes, all these movies, all this music, right? They are set in place just so you can do what Baldwin is trying to advise his nephew not to do, which is to believe what the white world says to be true about blackness or about people of culture, period. Right, And he says, you must accept them and accept them with love. For these innocent people have no other hope. They are in effect still trapped in a history they do not understand. And until they understand it, they cannot be released from it. So this is what Baldwin offers as a solution to this problem, right? to love these innocent people because their, their survival is dependent on it, right? It's not because of your survival is dependent on it. Their survival is dependent on it. Therefore, the survival of the world is dependent on these people being able to come to terms with their history. And because they have not been able to come to terms with their history, this problem that we call racism still continues, right? And he closes the, the um, letter, you and I know, you know, excuse me, and I know that the country is celebrating 100 years of freedom, 100 years too soon. Because for some segment of the, of the country, there was never freedom, right? So that's how he ends this um, letter to his nephew. But I, I want to talk about how he ends the book, The Fire, next time. And this becomes very important as we move into the remainder of our semester. Again, you guys didn't read this, but this is from the actual book. Um, if we, and now I mean the relatively conscious whites and the relatively conscious blacks, who must, like lovers, insist on or create the consciousness of the other, do not falter in our duty now. We may be able, handful that we are, to end the racial nightmare and achieve our country and change the history of the world. If we do not dare every, sorry, if we do not now dare everything, the fulfillment of that prophecy recreated from the Bible in song by a slave is upon us. God gave Noah the rainbow sign. No more water, the fire next time. Does anybody okay, does anyone know the story of Noah? 
the biblical story of Noah. Okay, so um, in the Bible, yep, Ash, Ash, yeah. Ashton, can you kind of give us a brief synopsis of Noah's Ark? Um, I kind of forgot what it was. I think it was that God said that they wanted, he wanted to like restart the world mm -hmm. by flooding it. And he told Noah to bring like two animals, two of each species onto this one ark to preserve them. And he would bring his family and stuff too. So humanity was fucking up, right? And God was getting sick of this shit. And he's like, oh, I'm just getting rid of all y'all. And I'm going to flood the world to get rid of all y'all. But I do want to be able to restart humanity. Noah's one of my favorite, um, one of my faithful servants. So I'm going to tell him, yo, build this boat. So when these waters come, yet you and your family will be safe, right? So that's the biblical story. But then what Baldwin is doing, right? So this is what Noah did. So there's no more sign. There's no more, um, sorry, excuse me. God gave Noah the rainbow sign, right? So a rainbow comes after the rains, right? So the flood is now over. But he also warned Noah, no more water. So I'm allowing you to restart humanity, Noah. But I'm going to warn you. Next time y'all start fucking up, I ain't flooding nothing. I'm burning all this shit down right? No more water, the fire next time. This book was published in 1963. We should think about what's going on in the early to mid 60s for black folks, right? Civil rights struggle is um, in its height, in its trending towards its apex. Yep, you're on it, you're on it Arturo. Um, the civil rights movement, my, uh, Martin Luther King, right? Nonviolence, right? Integration was their major, excuse me, was their major um, task. Their uh, their desired outcome was to integrate a segregated society. So this is happening on one section in, of the black world. On the other section of the black world, you have groups like the Black Muslims, the Nation of Islam, um, folks like Malcolm X, folks like Elijah Muhammad, right? And they're saying, yeah, y'all are talking that integration. That's cool, but what we're about is complete separation, right? So not segregation to where y'all live on one side of town and your schools and your banks are better than ours. We live on this side of town and our, all of our stuff is shitty. No, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about we're going to just completely separate. We're going to take these portions of the southern states and just build up a black nation within the within America, right? This is the this is the goal of the Nation of Islam and uh, Malcolm X while he was a member of the Nation of Islam. Okay. So Baldwin is aware of this. In fact, in the book that part that you guys didn't read, Baldwin goes to meet with Minister, um, excuse me, with Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, right? And Baldwin's thinking and he's seeing what's going on. And he likens this warning that God gave Noah to America, right? So I see what's going on in America. You're not listening to the civil rights struggle. You killed the leader of the civil rights struggle, Martin Luther King. The fire's coming, right? Because black folks is getting restless. They're getting tired. The person who championed this struggle of nonviolence ended in a violent death. So this can only be sustained for so much longer until the fire comes and cleans things up. And that fire would look like the Black Panther Party would, would come to the um, scene in um, 63, so what, uh, five years later, right? So not only is this a book of pedagogy, not only is this a book of folklore, not only is this book funds of knowledge, right? This book is prophecy. Baldwin is making a prophetic predi uh, prediction that if America does not right these racial wrongs, the fire's coming. And these black folks is going to come and tear this shit up, right? This is the warning that Baldwin is giving. And he's cautioning black folks to focus on this idea of love. 
But again, it's not this romantic version of love, right? It's not about making mixed babies. It's about being honest with white folks in the way that they behave and letting them know their missteps, right? He used the analogy of our younger brothers is what he calls them, right? Uh, I'm the oldest of two brothers. Part of that responsibility of being the oldest is when you see your brother treating people poorly, you have to tell him that he's fucking up, right? And you're not going to do it. You don't only do it for the person that he's abusing, but you do it so he could be in a good space, right? And so this is what Baldwin's doing as well. I'm not only concerned with the Black folks who look like me that are the quote unquote victims of this institution, but I'm also concerned with these white folks who are per perpetrating this system because they're also being negatively impacted. And if they cannot be reconciled, then we can't move past this. So while he's concerned with the safety of the black body, he's also concerned with the soul of America and making sure that that is rectified because he knows if that's not rectified, then no one's gonna survive, right? Um, so we'll end it there. Um, remember, you have to have two fish bowls per semester. If you went twice already, you're good. You can only pass one time. Uh, you could talk about the video that was watched. You could talk about my notes. You could talk about your journal or your breakout rooms. All that's on the table. Um, does anybody want to volunteer the fish bowl? Okay, Vanessa, I got you. And if not, I'll call at Ashlyn. Okay, Ashlyn, got you. If we, we'll get one more. If not, I'll call at Randy. I finished mine. Okay, yeah, yeah, Destiny, you're good. Um, yeah, Arturo, you're good as well. Uh, Miguel, have you went twice for your fishbowl? No. Are you prepared to fishbowl today? Uh, yeah. Okay, so you'll be the last one then. So we'll have Vanessa, Ashlyn, and Miguel. So whoever wants to start, it's on you. I can go ahead and start. Um, so to my understanding, Baldwin's expression throughout the text was an advice to his nephew on how to navigate the world of segregation and racism for people of color. Um, a specific part of the text was, um, it stated, innocent and well-meaning people, your countrymen have caused you to be born under conditions. The way I analyze this was um, it represents the lack of evolution that the idea of racism is wrong. So people of color still need to fit the like they still need to fit the needs of what may seem right and wrong. So this is determined by those who feel as if people of color are stronger and more threatening. Thus, they create this um, criteria based on fear and how to display someone as weak or less. And then another line is, you must accept them and accept them with love for these innocent people have no hope. So you were talking about this professor, but the way I interpreted it was um, by different ways. So this can mean like peace and love can get you through hatred or accept those whose ancestors commended bad things upon your ancestors as you can pr now prove um, provide consequences to those who believe it is permissible to do the same or accept um, these people and they may accept you. So this line contains various meaning based on how you interpret it. Although I believe Baldwin was emphasizing to his nephew to respect those who have hurt you and your family as the history will not go away, you can at least determine your future. And um, um, if these actions were to come again, those, you know, there would be consequences. Thank you, Vanessa. Uh, I'm gonna circle back to your comment um, once we get to the fishbowl, okay? Um, Ashton or Miguel? Um, so one of the passages that I liked, it was like when Baldwin was concise in reminding his nephew that white people who put them down as inferior, it's only because of their own inhumanity and fear. And like, this just kind of made me think about how, like in the past, I think it was a little further back, like the antebellum period, when class status in the South, it involved like very poor white farmers and slaves. And I remember how like the slaves and the very poor white farmers, they were both in very bad economic situations relative to like this very small percentage of rich plantation owners. But instead of finding something in common with the African-American community, the poor white farmers, they would use their skin color to feel superior 
just so that they could like maintain this like convoluted sense of pride and dignity. So I just thought back to that. I think that's a really good call out, Ashlyn. And the only thing I would amend, um, there were no slaves, right? There were enslaved people having an enslaved experience, but you're right. And, and I think also what you, what you did not mention, that's a very fundamental part of, of what you're saying. During this time, there were starting to be formed alliances between poor whites and formerly or, or enslaved Africans. And because of these alliances, the powers that be came in and really up taught this idea of whiteness so that those who were poor and white felt an element of superiority against the people who were black, right? So that's the only thing that they had on them. And they made that such something of such high value that um, it gave them that little sense of pride and that little sense of power, right? And this was done again to undermine the connections that were being forged against class lines with poor working class people becoming to to unite. So that's a very, very good point, Ashley. Uh, Miguel? I'll just read my journal. Um, the reading was about uh, James writing a letter to his nephew about the realities of the country um, he grew up in, and it also gives him information on how to navigate this country. Um, yeah, that's all I got. So what I did want to circle back to um, Vanessa's point and, and this notion of love. I, I I talked about it last week, but I, I definitely want to make sure that you guys um, understand this because it's going to shift the way that you interpret what's going on. So again, um, Baldwin is not talking about this romantic love, this um, acceptance in the sense that I'm not going to, I'm going to be okay with the way that you're treating me. This is not what he's saying. Um, it's more so that love should do the work of a mirror, right? So if you think about you about to go out for the weekend and, and you're doing your shopping for your outfit, right? And you're putting together a mental picture of what this outfit will look like. You get that shit, you put it on, thinking everything is good. But before you leave your house, right, you're going to check the mirror. So that way, if, if something's off, you know what I mean, is that mirror is going to show you the little things that are off. Instead of you just going out here believing the image that you have in your head about your outfit is what the outfit is, the mirror is going to tell you exactly what that outfit looks like, right? If you don't look good in that outfit, that mirror is going to tell you. Your stomach poking out a little bit, that mirror is going to tell you that your stomach poking out, right? So Baldwin says, this is the work that love should do. Love should tell you when you're tripping. Love should tell you when you're treating people poorly, right? So it's not about accepting the atrocities that they're putting on you, right? It's about showing them who they are. And again, showing them how what they're doing speaks to their inhumanity, not to mine, right? That's a very large task to put on a people who have been oppressed for over 500 years, right? And I ask you guys, do you think that's a reasonable request of James Baldwin to ask of the Black community to serve as this mirror to this other community who's been whooping their ass for time unknown. Do you think that's a reasonable request? Arturo, do you think that's a, re a reasonable request to ask them to love them in spite of all that they've done? Um, I would believe, I would believe not. You believe not? I'll take that. Destiny, do you think that's a reasonable request to ask a community who's been abused for centuries to love their, not in the romantic way, but in the way that Baldwin's talking about, to love their abusers? Do you think that's reasonable? No, it, no, it shouldn't. Marjorie, what are your thoughts? Do you think that's a reasonable request? No, I think what they did was um, inhumane. I don't think that they deserve that. Okay. Juan, how about you? 
Personally, I don't, but obviously it's up to anybody else. Okay. Um, Miguel, what's your thoughts? It sounds nice, but no. Yeah. How about you, Ashley? Yeah, I'm not really sure. Okay. Vanessa, what are, you, what are your thoughts? Uh, no. No? So, but, right. Yeah, no, it's like a big request to ask. But I think it should more come from the people that did, you know, do those types of inhumane things to like self-reflect, even if they themselves didn't do it, you know, your their ancestors did. So it's it's like about self-reflection and awareness. Yeah, I, I agree. So then I ask you this. If that's an unreasonable request, and, and you know, I don't know, well, before I say that, I think going with the argument that James Baldwin lays out is asking a lot, right? And, and really what he's saying is they don't have the consciousness or the mental capacity to do that themselves, so it's going to be on you, right? Which I, I get that because they haven't shown that they could do this otherwise, right? So, so I understand that, but that's still asking a lot for me, right? But I ask y'all, if that's not the solution, then what is? how do you address this grievance? Because one, one can use the analogy of being in an abusive relationship, right? How do you deal with this abuser? Do you leave the relationship? Do you abuse him back, right? Do you just accept the abuse? What are your thoughts? How do you circumvent this? I think it's more of like, it could be more of forgiveness, but rather than don't don't forget, but forgive type. Okay. I take that. Anyone else? If you were if you were in an abusive relationship, would you be willing to not for but to forgive but not forget? Is that something that you have the mental capacity for? I mean, you guys know yourselves. Are you that forgiving of individuals? Um, I think that you can forgive, but you can't stay. Hmm. I agree. So Marjorie, where do we go? We, we go back to Africa. We carve out a piece of the so Southern part of the United States and make that ours. Um, go to Canada. Where, where, where do we go? I wouldn't know. <laughs> so, I pose these questions because these are the questions that African people are dealing with in America in the 1960s. And as we continue to go through our, our course in the next section, we're going to explore the various ways that we as well, African people have chose to deal with this question, right? Baldwin provides us one avenue. Uh, we'll read a little bit of Martin Luther King, who will provide us another avenue. Uh, we'll read a little bit of Malcolm X, who will provide another avenue. Um, we'll read a little bit of Huey P. Newton, which will provide an avenue. And then we'll read a little bit of um, Kwame Ture, formerly Stokely Carmichael, who will also provide another avenue. So these are the questions of this historical epic. These are the questions that the oral tradition starts to pick up and starts to do work around these questions. Um, also, with that being said, right, we're, we're dealing with folklore, storytelling in this section. We're going to transition into orality, so looking at poems and things of that nature. So that's what to expect going forward. Um, but there's no readings this week, Thursday or Friday. I will send you out your midterm study review guide, um, give you guys the weekend to kind of go over that. Uh, on Monday of next week, we'll go over that as a class. And then we, I will send you out your midterm that subsequent Thursday, and you'll have to turn that in to me by the following Monday. So that's what to expect next week. Um, if you have questions, don't hesitate to reach out to me. Uh, for all y'all in this class, I can't implore you enough. Go back, watch last week's lecture, because you're going to need to know very well what the pillars of white, sorry, the pillars of white inferiority are according to James Baldwin, because that is going to be a midterm question. So you're going to need to know that. So re-engage your um, recording from last week. Also, um, with your midterm, when that's going to be due, you're also going to need to turn in your journal. So you want to make sure that you're up to date with your journal. This will be your last journal entry 
before you turn in your journals with the midterm. Are there any other questions, comments, or concerns for me? Uh, I have a question about the journal. Yeah. Uh, I think I'm doing them wrong. Is there anywhere I can like in is the syllables where I could see how to do it properly? Um, give me one second, Miguel. Let me see. I think I'll put it on the Google Classroom site. Let me double check. Um, what, what are you doing in the journal, Miguel? How are you doing your journal? Uh, uh, I'm just, just writing down what, like, I got from the, from the reading. Okay. So what I think it's about. Um, that's somewhat what we're doing, but what I'm really looking for is there's four components to your journal. Okay. Um, and I write this down so you could have that. Um, the first component to your journal is the thesis. So what is the main argument or what is the main point of the reading? So one is the thesis. What is the main argument? What is the main point? Um, two is the analysis. How did you, Miguel, make sense of what James Baldwin was writing about? Was it a movie that you saw? Was it another reading that you did that helps you understand what Baldwin was talking about? So that's your second component. The third component is your contemporary analysis. So how does what James Baldwin wrote about in 1963 apply to what's going on in 2021? So that's your contemporary analysis. That's your third point. And then your final point is your um, questions. So whatever questions that you have about the text. Um, again, there's th I think about questions in three ways. One being questions for understanding. I don't get this, so I have a question. Two being question that produces further research. So I have this question. I'm going to answer this question by writing a term paper and attempting to answer this question. Um, the, the last one being, I don't agree with this. So I have a question around what I don't agree with. So you only have to write one question, but I'm looking for eventually as the semester gets, on, goes, gets along, your questions from evol evolving from, I don't understand this. So I have a question to this, a question of critique or a question to promote research. So those are the four components of your journal. I don't care how you do it. It could be a bullet point. It could be um, a paragraph. However you do is totally up to you. Um, so I'm um, just responding to your, your, your message, Ashlyn. I would use what I just told Miguel. So use those four components, thesis, analysis, contemporary analysis, questions. Your journal should read like that. Those should be the four things that I see in your journal. Thesis, what's the main argument or main point? Analysis, how did you make sense of the reading? Contemporary analysis, how does the reading apply to what's going on in today's world? And then finally, questions that you may have, okay? Um, so is it um, so is it okay? Like, should I like go back and like change some of the journal prompts that I've done already? Yeah, because I, I, that's what I'm looking for. I, that's the only criteria that I have in the journal are those four points. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have any questions? Okay. Other than that, you guys enjoy the rest of your week. Uh, be safe. Be healthy. Be wise. Vanessa, you good? Yeah, I was just gonna say thank you. Okay. All right. Well, you guys have a good rest of your weekend and I will see you next Monday for our midterm review. Peace.